Thank you for joining us for our Ask the Expert series for adults living with hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. I am here today at the Cerebrofluid Center for CSF Disorders at Johns Hopkins Hospital with Dr. Mark Luciano, a neurosurgeon, and Dr. Abe Mogakar, a neurologist, and my coworker, Jennifer Bouchard, HA's education manager. So, I love this question because I don't know the answer to this, so I'm so excited to get to ask it. What is the difference between slit ventricles and slit ventricle syndrome? Oh, I, th I think that, uh, that's a simple but important uh, differ differential. Slit ventricles is really just a description of anatomy. It means that the fluid spaces, the ventricles in the brain, are very small, and they're called slit because they're, they're so small they look like slits. Uh, it's just an anatomical description. Uh, and it's not an uncommon one in patients who've been shunted a long period of time. Many people, it's at one point it was estimated as 50 to 60 percent of people who've been shunted for a long time have very small ventricles or near slit ventricles. So in the adult population you would see it? It's not, not so uncommon to see over drainage. And, well, I'll, say, I'll just say small ventricles. Slit ventricle syndrome, the word syndrome really reflects a set of symptoms. It's a cluster of symptoms. Uh, and that means that there is some problem some symptoms that, that is felt to be associated with those small ventricles. And slit ventricle syndrome is usually uh, uh, a description of a person who has, first of all, small ventricles, shunted hydrocephalus, but also has episodic headaches. Those headaches have been uh, described as uh, building up slowly and increasing in pressure and then dramatically uh, decreasing in other episodes where they build and just go away on their own. Uh, but they can be quite diverse, really, in how they, how they present. But a person with, with headaches, uh, often somewhat episodic, and small ventricles is considered likely to have slit ventricle syndrome. And the number of patients that have symptoms from those small ventricles is actually uh, you know, small, uh, but uh, overdrainage is a general problem in our patients who, have, who are shunted for long periods of time. So you can have slit ventricles and not have slit ventricle syndrome. And be fine with it. Your, your images may show, yes, your ventricles are very small, they're nearly slit, but you're doing fine, and, and the uh, neurosurgeon would likely do nothing about it if you're doing very well with it. So I'm gonna ask this question with an example. Um, I'm ask, the question first is, is it harder to treat? And I'm asking it with this example. We see this a lot. Uh, somebody is feeling symptomatic that their shunt is not working, they go and get an MRI or a CT scan, their ventricles do not appear any different in size. What is happening mm -hmm. um, there in that situation? And is somebody with slit ventricles harder to treat as a, a neurosurgeon? Well, I should start off by saying that slit ventricles is something that, that uh, neurosurgery and shunting actually causes over a period of time. So. It's, it's a, it's a long-term effect of just draining a little bit too much, or maybe you can't even say too much, but in, in a non-physiological way. Being artificially drained. Artificially drained. So we've gotten ourselves into that small ventricle, and the patient has, over a long period of time. It is harder to treat when it develops. Again, many patients never have symptoms with it, but as you can imagine, if the ventricles are real small and the catheter is right in the middle, then uh, it's much more prone to get blocked, for example. Anytime the catheter has tissue around it, that tissue can stick to it, and the tissue can grow in, and you can get blockages. There's another issue with slit ventricles in that when the ventricles do collapse around a catheter, there may be fluid in many other parts of the brain that would love to be drained by that catheter, but that catheter is in an area that's all blocked up. The shunt's working fine, but it's blocked up by those slit ventricles, those uh, ventricle walls that are surrounding it. So there you can have these episodic headaches where where the shunt's not working for a period of time because it's closed off by the ventricles, pressure builds up, up, up all around, and then eventually it builds up enough that it opens up enough and fluid does drain and then it collapses. So you have sort of, if you can look at it, sort of almost a fluttering over time. And that's what's believed to be the cause of some of these episodic headaches with slit ventricles. So yes, they're, they can be hard to treat because they can get blocked more frequently. Often we, we try and, well, let's put it over here. This ventricle is much more collapsed because the catheter is right there, so we put the catheter someplace else. The problem with that is sometimes that area then collapses perhaps over some time, months or years. So anywhere we put the catheter uh, in the ventricle system, there can be some collapse uh, and a slip ventricle syndrome. Uh, 
and again, the issue of blockages. It's also difficult to treat because obviously our targets are smaller. We have to use uh, stereotactic navigation to get to the precise area uh, where there may be some fluid. Uh, the navigation systems these days work actually pretty well for that, but it is a small target, and the possibility of collapse uh, is still there no matter what the target is. Sometimes uh, we use lumbar drainage if it's feasible and, and do a lumbar drain because the fluid in the lumbar space does persist even when the ventricles are very small here. So there are other options, but it is a, is a difficult problem uh, that is of, often treated by, ironically, even though the person may have big spikes in pressure because the catheter is closed off intermittently, uh, by increasing the resistance to slow down the drainage to allow fluid to build up a little bit so that there's more even flow going out. So uh, we learned back when, before the adjustable uh, shunts to do an operation, take out a medium pressure valve, put in a higher pressure valve, decrease the amount of drainage, expand the ventricles a little bit. Uh, that does work if the patient can tolerate it. Uh, and, and nowadays we can adjust a little bit with the adjustable systems and, 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 and treat that way. So there are methods of treatment, but once that system evolves, uh, once the slip ventricle syndrome evolves, it is difficult to treat. One thing that, that I, uh, I always uh, mention because it always, I hear it so frequently, my child has gone 20 years with this shunt valve, done perfectly well. Now I've had three revisions in various places, and we have three revisions, all of them the shunts are break. Can't you just put the same darn valve you put in and he had for 20 years? And I really wish it was that simple. Because, in fact, that valve that was there was slightly overdraining all that time, and the ventricles were getting smaller and smaller. And now we're in a situation where we have to try and expand the ventricles very, very gradually. Uh, so, unfortunately, the same valve he had for 20 years uh, that worked well is, is not the solution either. It's, it's a bit harder to treat. I think the thing that's scary for patients living with slit ventricles um, or parents uh, who have children with slit ventricles is that fear of traveling, right? Or going somewhere else. Um, that MRI, you know, they, they go into symptomatically, the individual, uh, the adult goes into shunt failure. They go to the ER and the doctor's like, there's nothing wrong. Like I'm looking at your scans, everything looks fine. Well and they're in incredible pain. Um, and so I, I'd love just, Table the advice on how to deal with that for one second and, and answer this one question from a non-medical practitioner. And I'm hoping that many of you guys have also thought this and, and maybe you're trying to make sense of it. So let me see it, what Dr. Luciano says. Does your brain become less able to, as, as the ventricles might increase a little bit, tolerate that movement because it's, it's not as... It's gotten stiff. The brain has gotten stiff. So when even just the tiniest little bit of pressure, which on a scan wouldn't show up, could be really painful for somebody. So, you, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, what happens when those ventricles get smaller? I mean, it's, it's a, your head doesn't get any smaller. Right. And what's happening really is your brain is expanding a bit. It's, it's swelling a little bit. And that is due to increased uh, fluid in the veins and the vascular system. Uh, and increased fluid in, in the tissue itself. So the brain, in a sense, gets used to being kind of big. It gets used to taking up the space where the ventricles are. And then when we try and, as I mentioned before, try and push back, push back the walls of the and, and ventricle and drain less, uh, the brain will resist uh, because it, 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 in a sense, is fuller now. Mm. Uh, and it may not be, it was thought in the past that it was actually a scarring and so forth that did, or a gliosis. It may not be that, but it's, it's very likely that the brain is just, in a sense, larger and fuller than it was, largely for, because of fluids that are there. So uh, the, the, the brain does change over that period of time. What's remarkable, though, uh, is that we've seen situations where uh, it's hard to get the ventricle big, but then all of a sudden they get, they get very large, sometimes too large. So we've seen situations where we said, well, the, you have slip ventricles that never got any bigger, and, uh, and they can, and they've shown themselves very, very frequently to get bigger, and sometimes uh, in ways that, that uh, obviously go too far. Mm -hmm. We've had patients who, uh, after a lumbar puncture, we think because the fluid on the outside, is, the fluid pressure from the outside is being decreased acutely, they go from having slip ventricles to bigger ventricles. So there are, are dynamics here that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, 
in how to how to get out of that situation where the brain is taking up all the space and the ventricles are tiny. How do you get the ventricles to expand uh, back to a, a, a tolerable and more treatable uh, state? So, Jen, you talk about, and you mentioned overdrainage, so I'm going to ask Jen this question. You, you talk about overdrainage a lot. Um, what does that feel like? It's and, very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe it, like, in words? I'm just curious. So, for me, it's going to sound a little crazy, but I get the most pain at the base of my brain, and it kind of feels like a vacuum is, like, sucking it downward. Um, but I get a ton of pain back here, and I know immediately that I have to lie flat for like 30 minutes or an hour. We've FaceTimed or Google Hangout where I'm working from the couch laying down. <laughs> True story. But um, I also get nausea with it. I get very nausea and sometimes have vomiting with it. So what's happening with overdrainage? And um, clearly this is so intertwined with yeah. blood ventricles. Yeah, so the ventricles is one aspect. The other times we may have ventricles that look you know, quite normal or, or slightly small. And the, uh, the physicians looking at the image are right to say, that looks, that looks great. You have no acute increase in, in, in the ventricle size. Everything looks stable. Everything looks good. Yet there is over drainage. It just doesn't, doesn't make it to, to change the size. The symptoms you described, Jennifer, are, are, are the classic ones, mm -hmm. pulling down in the neck and the back of the head. Uh, you can get nausea. Sometimes people are not as a uh, able to differentiate, unfortunately, high pressures from low pressures. They come in, I know I have high pressure, and they really have low pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, for example, people who may have Chiari malformation, which is the tightness back here, might develop symptoms of their Chiari because they're overdrained and the, and the brain is starting to sag a little bit. Uh, overdrained is something we see in adult hydrocephalus and, and people who've been shunted for a long period of time. Uh, well, it should be recognized more. I can't give you a percentage because I think right now we say it's a small percentage, but we, we, we do know that there are people who have, as we said, normal looking ventricles and symptoms that are truly overdrained. So it's something we have to look for more and more. With the intracranial pressure monitoring, we can uh, occasionally detect very low pressures in people we thought you know, didn't have that problem. And then it can take just an adjustment of the valve or uh, a valve change to make a person feel you know, better. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's something that we hate to miss because it's something we can really treat. So I'm going to close up the session actually with Dr. Mogakar because he is um, a partner in crime with me on a special project that we have. And I want to go back to that traveling issue. There are individuals with hydrocephalus who travel who have slit ventricles. Um, whether it's slip ventricle syndrome or just slip ventricles, who walk into an ER and people don't believe them. So what to do individuals with hydrocephalus who are traveling, whether it's for business or pleasure, need to make sure they have with them so that the doctor who is receiving them on the other end in an emergency situation understands what really is a complex medical history, um, but not to discount what they're seeing on an MRI. So. So with the Hydrocephalus Association working with Amanda, Jennifer, um, we've developed a mobile application called as HydroAssist, where you can essentially have the information about your shunt, about your surgeries, um, put in there for easy access. And we also have the cap capability now to have certain relevant snapshots of your most recent imaging um, in there. Uh, so that if there is a change, it may be easier to detect. You know, ideally, you should also have a paper backup of this, carry a CD with your most recent CT or MRI with you uh, if you're going to be traveling uh, long distances. So I, I think uh, having as much information as possible about your shunt and about your most recent imaging uh, should allay some of your concerns. And is it um, unrealistic to ask your one of your doctors uh, to, it, it most it would probably be the neurosurgeon to on that on the notes that you're taking the surgical notes that you're taking with you or on a cover letter this person has smaller ventricles please note that when reviewing an MRI or well we certainly do include that in our records with every visit so that that should be there along, along with the images great I think that that will um, allay some fears that a lot of people have as they are traveling around what they need to have with them and how they don't have to fight <laughs> to make their case like, no, I really am having issues right now. Because we do hear that like people don't believe me uh, and I really am in failure. And I think it goes back to another segment that we had taped 
earlier where we discussed uh, being in a new city, moving to a new city, should you find a neurosurgeon, this would be a compelling reason to absolutely find care wherever you are living, even if you've gone 20, 30 years without any problems, uh, because you could be this situation. If you've had a shunt your whole life, um, your, slit, your ventricles could be smaller. You might appear normal on a scan, but be symptomatic and in a, in a shunt failure situation. So Another important thing I, I, w I would advise in, in many patients who have lived with hydrocephalus for decades there's been many operations. It's, it is complicated for anybody to come into and, and, and understand what's going on. It's, it's always wonderful when, when we have a new patient coming in who the family has logged over some time, at least a, a series of operations. I mean, our office, obviously we get this, try and get this from the history. But uh, uh, in this complex world, it's very nice if the, the patient takes some responsibility to try and organize what their treatment has been. Uh, on, and obviously the, the hydrocyst has, has that kind of uh, potential as well, but when we see uh, some ongoing record of, of what the patient's been through, including the size of the ventricles and so forth, it is so helpful uh, and will help a new, new neurosurgeon coming in in a you know, baseline or an emergent situation to understand things. So I would encourage everybody to kind of keep a log uh, of the important events that have happened uh, in their hydrocephalus history and keep the, their most recent and some really old images perhaps, you know, on a disc in the in the glove compartment when you travel, or on your hydro assist app, uh, or on your hydro assist app, <laughs> better still. So I would say with with technology nowadays, and I'll leave everybody with this thought: uh, not only do you have the hydro assist app available on Google Play and on the App Store for the iPhone, but you also do many hospitals now also have my chart or patient portals where they can access their medical records and medical histories. So make sure that you're always prepared when you are traveling. But in terms of slit ventricle syndrome and slit ventricles, you can have slit ventricles, not have slit ventricle syndrome. Um, ultimately, I think you know, the care and management of the complexity of that is the same. Um, slit ventricle syndrome seems to be accompanied with some headaches as well. So that's the differentiator. Um, and I think it's, it's great to actually understand the difference between the two um, so that you can talk about it with your doctor. So thanks everybody for joining us today. And thank all of you for watching. For those of you that submitted questions through Facebook and Twitter, thank you for being a part of our Ask the Expert series. And we'll see you next time.